The reading from the Gospel comes from the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Well, today is a day for stories of mountaintop experiences. We have Moses going up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And we hear about the, the glory of the Lord. And it's, it's fiery. People see fire at the top of the mountains. And then, of course, is the cloud. Moses enters the cloud for 40 days and 40 nights. And then we have a companion story in the gospel, what we call the transfiguration. Jesus leads Peter and John and James up the mountain, different mountain, similar dynamic. While they are there, they see Jesus transfigured, his face is bright with light. His robes are dazzling white. That's the sign of the glory of God, the kavod, they call it in Hebrew. Same experience. That with the glory of God comes light. And it's a stunning experience. And as they look, Moses and Elijah are there, the great prophets, greatest of the great. And they are having a three-way conversation with Jesus. And Peter, who I, I always love his enthusiasm, and he always seems to get it wrong, <laughs> says, this is fabulous. Let's build structures here to preserve this experience. Let's, let's never leave. Let's stay here. Let's hang on to this amazing epiphany of God. Well, Jesus has other ideas. And while Peter is still speaking. A voice comes from the cloud, 
That's also part of the experience of the glory of God. And says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And that's an echo of some words that we've heard earlier. Words we heard in January as Jesus was baptized by John. Remember that voice. As the dove descended, so also came the voice that Jesus heard saying, You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Mountaintop experiences. And then, in another key, you may remember Martin Luther King Jr.'s mountaintop speech. He gave this speech in Memphis. He was there for the sanitation worker strike. It was the day before he was assassinated. April 3rd, he gave the speech. April 4th, he was assassinated on the assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. And it's interesting because he also, consummate preacher, is talking about mountaintop experiences, and this one is a little different. It is Moses, and it's Moses being led to see the promised land on the other side of the Jordan, and then being told by God that he will not be leading the people there. Now, of course, he is 120 years old, and that might have something to do with it. But here, listen to Martin Luther King. He's, he knows that his life is threatened. Basically, he's telling stories of the many times that his life has been threatened, including a time where a woman actually held a knife to him. He says, and I want to say tonight, I want to say that I am happy I didn't sneeze. He was later told by doctors that if he had sneezed, he would have been dead. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And wherever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later in that year in August to tell America about the dream that I had been having. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama, been in Memphis to see the community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me, now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked 
and to be sure that nothing would be wrong with the plane, we had to check everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got to Memphis. And some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like everybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that tonight we as a people will get to that promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The glory. We use that phrase mountaintop experiences rather glibly to talk about the highest, the best, the ultimate, Sometimes what is life-changing, some of us have had them, most of us have heard of them. Best of the best, as Henry Nouwen said here in our uh, thought for meditation, it's that, that time when everything fits. And as he says, these moments are given to us so that we can remember them when God seems far away and everything appears empty and useless. These experiences are true moments of grace. We experience God in a different way, so very close, so real, often when we need it most. I've had some of these experiences, and even before I read Henry Nouwen, I called them moments of grace. So amazing, so comforting, so fortifying. But I don't live there every day. And neither do James and John and Peter. They have the instinct to know that what is happening is indeed the kavod, the glory of God in their midst. And their first instinct is to build something. Let's save this forever. And they are overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed, by a bright cloud with a voice that says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. And they do the only logical thing. They fall face down to the ground. As Garrison Killer once said, they hug the ground. They're hugging the ground, they're so terrified. Jesus comes and touches them, a real live touch, and tells them, get up, don't be afraid. And when they look up, before they get up, all they see is Jesus. And he leads them down the mountain. But that mountaintop experience will never leave them. The real story of mountaintop experiences for me is what happens later in the valley. Yes, we have moments of grace and they're to be savored and revisited often when we need them the very most. 
because they call us to be faithful and courageous and bold. But it's not always in big ways. When I was here a few weeks ago, we sang the hymn, The Summons, Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? And never be the same. And never be the same. It's transfiguration for Jesus. For us disciples, it's transformation. And where we experience most powerfully is not on the mountaintop, but in the valley. As I mentioned to you earlier, I did serve at a church in Memphis for the first six years of my ministry. And in that church, as often happens, or it did in those days, this was the mid-80s, uh, a young couple came to join the church because they wanted to have their son, John, baptized. Now, the mom, Lynn, had come to Memphis to go to graduate school and had met the dad, Wally, uh, and so she stayed in Memphis, but she came as, as, a, as a birthright Presbyterian. So she knew where they were going to church. Wally was a recurring Southern Baptist. That's how he described himself. And he thought the best way to deal with church was to just take it very lightly. So he'd come, but he said, I'm not going to join anything. I'm not going to be on a committee. And so a few years later, <laughs> The nominating committee asked him if he would be nominated to serve as elder. And when they told me they were going to do this, I thought, good luck. <laughs> and he said yes. And now Wally was a CPA, but a true extrovert and really, really funny. And most of his funny stories he told on himself. But he said to me, do you want to know why I said yes? And I said, I do. And he said, well, it all has to do with the first and second grade Sunday school class. And I said, tell me about that. Well, his wife was pregnant again, and she was really having a difficult time. And, you know, 9.30 on a Sunday morning was not her best moment. So. She asked Wally if, if he would come with her so that if she had to leave the room and run to the bathroom, um, you know, the kids would be safe. Uh, and so he agreed to do this, and he helped her carry her stuff up the stairs. And he fell in love with the first and second grade Sunday school class. God, you are so clever. <laughs> And one of the kids in that class was a kid named Michael who came with his grandmother because his mother had abandoned him. Truly. She brought her kids to her mom and said, I need a break for a week, and she never came back. Wow. Those were some confused kids. And Michael, who was in second grade, was having a really hard time with reading. And so as the first and second grade class began to work on Bible stories, oftentimes they would take turns reading. And when it was Michael's turn, he would sort of sidle over to Wally. And Wally would kind of put an arm around him. And then Michael would read. And by then, their older son, John, was ready to you know, go on outings. And so when they went to the zoo or the pool or wherever, they started calling Michael's grandmother and saying, can we take Michael? Because John just loved Michael. Moments of grace. And I knew all that in part because I was hearing it from Wally and I was also hearing it from Michael's grandmother, from her perspective. 
and God was at work in all of it. And when the baby was born, they sent out birth announcements, and I knew why this child was named Michael. He was named after Lynn's uncle, who died very young. But then I heard the story from Michael's grandmother that they sent the birth announcement to all of the kids in the Sunday school class. And so Michael never got mail, and there he was. He opened up the birth announcement, and he read it to his grandmother. And when he saw the name, first name was Michael, he turned to her and he said, they named him after me. They really love me. Transformation. Moments of grace. Not always on mountain tops. Sometimes in the first and second grade Sunday school class. The hymn, the summons says, ask the question. It's all full of questions. Will you love the you you hide? If I but call your name, will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Jesus was transfigured. We, his disciples, are transformed. And whether we experience that or on mountaintops, sometimes, or in the valley, more often, our lives are transformed to tell these stories and to live them out in real time, in our real lives. Because we also are visited by the glory of God. Thanks be to God.